how many stars will be in the US flag in 50 years? And, and before you answer that question, there has never been a president of the United States buried under the same flag he was born under. Right? No president of this country has been buried under 50 stars. And no president will be buried under 50 stars unless if there isn't a change and somebody who was born after 59 dies with no change. You can easily see scenarios where the US would go to 55 stars. But if you follow the European question, you also see scenarios where countries get smaller, not larger. What was the thing in you, it's a nature nurture, I don't know what that is, that propels you into wanting to be a futurist, studying genomics, like all of this, what sets you, what's the thing that inspired you or you saw, you learned, you said, I'm going in to find out what's in front of us. What was that? When did that start? So I got so angry and frustrated by the amount of poverty and corruption in Mexico that I swore to myself I was going to fix Mexico. And I prepared myself all through college and all through business school. I was the only kid who came out of my business school class and went straight into government. And I was helping on fixing it. And, you know, it finally got to the point where some people had no sense of humor about cutting down on corruption and such things. So they decided they were going to kill me. And I thought I'd take a few months sabbatical and preferably not get killed. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good time to take a sabbatical. <laughs> and, you know, God bless it. I, I ended up having a New Year's conversation with a scientist. And the stuff he was doing was so interesting that within three months, I decided to change my focus to this understanding of genomics, which then in 95 didn't exist. You know, the first living organism has just been sequenced. And by God, I could read every single article ever written about genomics and put it on my dining room table. So it was being present at the creation. And, and in my mind, the ability to read, write, and change life code is one of the most interesting things a human being can do. And it fundamentally alters life on this planet. And that's a bigger deal than one country. And that's why I shifted my career into that. And then... Once I got really comfortable with genomics about five or six years ago, then I shifted to synthetic neurobiology at MIT because I think we're now at a stage where we're going to be able to remake every one of our body parts. So in the same way as you remake your teeth when you lose them at least once, and in the same way as you rebuild, rebuild your skin when it burns or a bone when it breaks, we're going to be able to redo our kidneys. We're going to be able to redo our eyes, et cetera, et cetera. So the barrier to longevity at that point becomes the brain. And even if we were able to reproduce the brain, we still wouldn't live for a long time, at least with the same memories, right? So to my mind, the fundamental barrier to humanity being able to travel outside the solar system becomes a problem, not just of radiation resistance, but of longevity. And that's where the brain is so interesting. And that's where I think future evolution sits. And that's where I think that the biggest challenges and the biggest changes in our humanity are things like Understanding what happens if you erase a thought, if you induce a thought, if you change a feeling, if you're able to share feelings, if you're able to induce feelings. And boy, do the ethical questions get interesting. A lot of times I think we're at the beginning, right? The very beginning. And the very beginning is the, the first map of the human genome, Craig Ventner's genome. Uh, why do you think that's the beginning? Or do you disagree that that's the beginning? I think the map of the human genome was the end of the beginning. You know, I think this starts with Mendel and it goes through Darwin and it goes through the discovery of genetics with Avery McLeod and then it goes through Watson and Crick. So there were many people who did pretty extraordinary things. And that culminated in the first map of human gene code. But it was really when that gene code got cheap, when it went from being a billion dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars to a hundred dollars when you started having the ability to manipulate the genome through CRISPR, when you started having the ability to make synthetic life forms. That's where it really gets interesting. We have a framework for thinking about nuclear proliferation. We don't really have a framework for synthetic biology. So has the law sort of caught up with, with where we are ethically and morally in terms of what, what is possible with the human genome? You know, one of the fascinating things is how norms change over time. So the laws of today are going to be very different from the laws of tomorrow. And what we think is right, responsible, and just with the human genome 
today is going to look very different tomorrow. But let me give you an example. Two years ago, a Chinese scientist, without a whole lot of warning, claims to have edited two live human beings that were born. And that created such a mess that the whole thing was rejected by the science community. And you ended up in a situation where this guy might be in jail today. Completely agree you should not be editing babies today. It's not safe. It's, we don't know what we're doing. We don't know the consequences. But I want you to think about that same conversation with grandkids in 30 years, where the grandkids say, you know, my parents were so primitive and so backward. They didn't edit out my KRAS gene. They didn't edit out my BRCA gene. They didn't edit out, edit out my PPT3 gene. And so unlike most of my peers, I ended up with cancer. And they had the ability to take out those genes. They had the ability to take out a gene for Alzheimer's. And, and they were so superstitious and primitive, they didn't do it. BRCA1, you know, if you have BRCA1, you have a much higher chance of getting cancer, right? Um, but a lot, of, but when you say Alzheimer's, we don't even really know what genes are definitively involved in Alzheimer's, right? So, and, and if we tinker with them, you know, you're talking about a billion, you know, genes in order, you know, how do we know what to take out and what to put in and what, how do we know what the effects of that will be at this time? I completely agree with you, Jesse. And just to reinforce that, it's very rare that you find a trait which is really strongly inherited. It's even weirder to find traits that are really strongly inherited up to call it 50%. And usually when you find a gene like that, which is highly predictive, it's a pretty definitive gene. So, you know, there's very specific mutations that lead to Huntington's disease, which means you're going to die not well, not old. There's also diseases like cystic fibrosis that depend not on a single gene, but depend on a single letter change inside your genome. So when you find things that are highly predictive and highly directive, if you have this, then it is likely you're going to have that. It tends to be easy to identify. And as you say, the genes for Alzheimer's aren't something that you're likely to be able to find easily, even though there does seem to be a correlation with an ApoE4 gene. So there is a allele, a portion of a gene, that does seem to be somewhat predictive of Alzheimer's. But that's where the story gets really weird because one of the highly predictive traits, apparently, of genes is intelligence. And so people think, some say, that up to 50% of your innate intelligence is inherited. Hmm. And therefore, you'd be able to find those genes because it is such a highly predictive and conserved gene or set of genes. But study after study after study with enormous amounts of people hasn't found those genes. And so that's where the story gets very weird because normally when you find something that's highly predictive, you can probably isolate it, but not in the case of intelligence. And I think that's actually a good thing. Who's in charge of all this? It, you know, let's say... Isn't that something we have to figure out as well? To who's making the decision around what gets edited out or what are we duplicating? And how is this different than trying to create a super race? I mean, how do we manage it ethically from an ethical perspective? Like how do we teach people and who's gonna be in charge of all this? You know, that's a question that was an awful lot easier to answer five years ago, even easier to answer 10 years ago. When I started in this genomics field, you had almost every single person who was doing genomic sequencing in the ballroom at the Fontainebleau Hotel for a convention. And there weren't that many of us. And today, you know, any kid in a college classroom can not only sequence genes, in fact, in a grammar school classroom, can not only sequence genes, but they're beginning to be able to assemble genes as the technology gets faster, better, cheaper. It's not just the you know, scientific societies that are going to tell their members don't do this. It's not like you can send a letter to the internet and say to the internet, don't do this. This has become DIY. It is global. It is widespread and it's getting faster, better, cheaper. So I think establishing societal norms that are legitimate global norms and having an open discussion on this is going to be incredibly important. You know, um, with COVID, we see that having a global conversation around a, 
pandemic is incredibly difficult and that certain, you know, all societies sort of see it very differently. How do you feel that a global perspective will, will, um, you know, develop, you know, it, it being that we're living through a time which seems like it's in, almost in opposition to the enlightenment? Well, one of the things that was fascinating about COVID is how terribly unprepared and ineffective a series of democracies were. I mean, it was shocking to me how poorly California did in the first two waves. It was shocking to me that Japan and China were able to control this to such an extent. You can take the first wave and say we were unprepared, we didn't know what was coming, we didn't understand. Okay, fair enough. So you get a pass on the first wave. But the second wave was bigger than the first wave. And the second wave hit very unevenly. And so there were countries that took the first wave seriously, that locked down, that did a whole series of things. And then there were a whole series of countries led by the United States that should have had the best response, that should have had the best public infrastructure, that had been preparing for pandemic for decades, that had been warned about these pandemics. I mean, there were, there were books like Laurie Garrett's that were very clear about what was going to happen. And somehow our system of government was not able to cope with this challenge in the first wave, in the second wave, and now even in this wave, right? Because you've got a Delta variant sitting out there that is nastier and more contagious than the previous variants, that is likelier to put you into the hospital. And you still have states that are, you know, 50% vaccinated, despite widespread availability of the vaccine. Even less than 50%. I think... um... I don't. I forget which state it is, but I heard about a state this morning that's only thirty-seven percent vaccinated. You know, and the vaccinations are sitting there. How is this? You know, our response going to shape our our future? You know, it's like, you know, how does technology shape the way we think, and how is it going to how is it going to shape what were the issues? You know, you were talking about we would look back and at our grandparents and say, well, geez, I can't believe they didn't edit out this gene, but there's so many places that technology is at a a new place in our lives. You know, this is, this has really shown, you know, people are living, living digitally now more than ever. Uh, They're, they're transporting themselves to living a life online. You know, how do you see the technology uh, playing in the future? You know, I've been sitting thinking about the intersection of ethics and technology for several years. And I thought the answer to your question was going to be a really easy answer. You know, follow these 10 rules and all will be okay because we're used to thinking that way and the thing which i realized which is enormously complicating my life is that it's very hard to answer your question and it's very hard to answer your question because ethics really fundamentally change over time but what we thought once upon a time was okay we now realize was savage and brutal like human sacrifice like guillotining people in public squares. The second thing is technology is probably the primary driver of change in what we consider to be right and wrong. Because as technology gives us alternatives, we're able to be more generous towards others. We're able to give people more things. And then we look back and say, how dare we not have done that before? And then the third point is technology is accelerating. And in the measure that technology accelerates, what you're gonna start finding is our notion of what is right, what is wrong, what is ethical and what is not, is also gonna start changing at a much faster speed. So simple question, but wow. You you recently, I know you, you, you had the incredible TED talk you did, I think last year, where you talked about sort of, you know, we can use the internet, social media as a weapon that's become a personal weapon and anybody has it at their disposal. How do we organize and how do we build against or defend against this sort of all out? You talked about the polarization, which of course is getting worse and worse and worse. So who's going to be thinking about that? What kind of thinkers do we need to help us? Because you, you know, surely there are people who can help us figure this part out, I hope. You know, I think that there are two words that we very rarely use these days because we're so certain that we're right and we're so polarized. And those two words are humility and forgiveness. And so it's very easy to not understand how often we have to change our minds and how often things change. And so 
I think the kind of thinkers that we need are people who are willing to change their mind when the evidence changes. And I think a science training of this experiment failed, let me change my mind, or the evidence has shown up, let me change my mind. I think training people in the scientific method of if there's better evidence, change it. And I understand Thomas Kuhn, the paradigm of you know, how difficult it is to change people's minds. But that whole notion that presented with new evidence, eventually you have to change your mind is really important. The second thing that I think is really important is in an era where you're either on this side or that side, you're this party or that party, you believe in this or you believe in that. I, I think we've got to push something which has 50 shades of gray as opposed to black and white in. And, and you have to understand in, in this debate on the internet, there are horrible things we're doing with the internet, right? There's horrible things we're doing with social media. But on the other hand, you would not have had the BLM movement on a global scale in 48 hours without a video that went viral of George Floyd, right? And, and the proof of that is in Rodney King because Rodney King you know, was pretty bad, not as drastic in its final outcome, but that was ugly. And that was on camera. And that was filmed and that led to riots in Los Angeles and a couple other places, but it didn't lead to a global phenomenon of this has to be fixed now. And so the interesting thing about global media today and it, it, is it makes everybody a broadcast studio. And, and that's a true power. I mean, you've got you've to think about coups between countries. The first thing the coup leaders would do, normally the generals, is they take over the TV and the radio stations. The newspapers, they had time, but, but you had to take over the broadcast media. And, and now what you've done is you put a full broadcast, high definition studio inside everybody's pocket with the ability to broadcast globally for free. And, and that changes the equation of power. So yes, there's some horrible things that have gone on with social media and stuff, but, but it's shades of gray. It's not shut it down, right? You, you don't want to live in a country where the whole internet is shut down by the whims of whoever's in charge. Yeah. You know, um, critical thinking, you know, I think what you're saying, scientific method is critical thinking. You know, it seems like we've moved away from that and, and we don't live in an era of critical thinking. And how, how important is it to, to bring back that, that, you know, I mean, in a sense, we, we don't have a shared understanding right now of what it means to be American, right? We, you know, people on the radical right think it's a totally different thing than people on the radical left. So what does it mean not to have a shared identity, a shared understanding of the values of a place? You know, that's one of the single most important questions that every country has to ask itself because a country is a collection of people who believe in the same myths. And many of them are myths, right? This, this is not a place where there are truths and those truths are self-evident and those truths are the same for everybody the colonization of the Americas is a very different story for somebody who is Mayan or somebody who's Apache or somebody who is a Pemaquid than it is for, you know, the white Dutch or even the German or the Irish or the X or Y or Z. And everybody's got their own versions of history, but they choose to teach children a narrative of a nation of a flag, of a common purpose. And that narrative, if it starts falling apart, then you start getting new flags and you get new anthems and you get new borders. And, and that's a process which takes place even if there is a great deal of repression against that country. Think East Germany, right? It would have been very difficult to have a more effective secret service, uh, police, et cetera, than East Germany. These were not bumblers. They, these were very effective people. And yet there came a point where the whole narrative fell apart because it wasn't legitimate. And within 24 hours, the whole damn thing was gone. It, it took one hole in the wall once the legitimacy was lost for that thing to crumble. When you think of what caused some of the riots in a couple of other places in Egypt, the, the Arab Spring was started because a street salesman was extorted by the police and you know, he was just so tired that he fought back and burned himself. 
And, and that video went viral and created the Arab Spring, not just in Egypt, but across all series places. So the question you're asking, which is a really fundamental question, can be summarized in one line. How many stars will be in the US flag in 50 years? And before you answer that question, there has never been a president of the United States buried under the same flag he was born under. Right? No president of this country has been buried under 50 stars. And no president will be buried under 50 stars unless if there isn't a change and somebody who was born after 59 dies with no change. You can easily see scenarios where the US would go to 55 stars. But if you follow the European question, you also see scenarios where countries get smaller, not larger. And, and when you lose that common ground, when you lose the ability to speak to half the country, to sit at dinner table with half the country, you're, you're, you're digging a pretty deep hole. Does it feel to you inevitable? I mean, it, I mean, what you're talking about is just so, you know, it, massive to think about. Do you think, do you have any instinct around what could happen here in a rearrangement in the, these United States? Of, of a rearrangement, you know, which we're even just to the flag this weekend, of course, with Juneteenth and so many things happening. There's a lot of conversation. I've been reading articles around what is the flag? What does the flag look like? Um, you know, what are we, what happens now and who has the power and does it need like a, a major revolution or can this be reorganized? Like how does this all rearrange itself? You know, you have example after example of these rearrangements. So you've tripled the number of flags, borders, and anthems in Europe during the last century. The world's greatest pole vaulter, Sergei Bubka, actually won in three different Olympics and ended up watching three different flags with three different anthems without ever having moved from his town, which was Donetsk. And, and so Europeans, I think, are more used to this than Americans are. The last truly new border in the Americas was Panama in about 1903. You know, borders shift a little bit, but you don't have these new borders. Now think of Europe. Not only have the flags, borders, anthems tripled, but you've got debates today as what, to whether there's going to be more in Scotland, southern Finland, Corsica, northern Italy, the Walloons, the Basques, the Catalans. It goes on and on. So... You know, there's a real debate in Europe, how many of us and who belongs together? What is a nation? What is a country? I hope that that's not a debate that we have here because those debates, once they start, are, are tough to put away. Now, you know, um, uh, usually those are settled by war with great amounts of death, um, not in all cases, but in a lot of cases, you know, um, I was talking to a scientist who had an experiment who lived in Greece and he was doing his experiment, this is before the pandemic, was doing his experiment in CERN and, you know, uh, Geneva, you know, and I was like, well, why are you, why are you doing that? Why aren't you trying to do it in, in Greece? And he said, well, uh, science is bigger than one country now, right? And, you know, some would say that the highest ideal of the human race is to leave this planet. And, you know, Elon Musk is making plans to, to you know, to, to go to Mars. Is that a, is that the sort of uh, galvanizing mythological idea that can, can pull us out of this regional factionalism uh, in a sense? Is that a bigger myth than any one country? Is it something for us to believe in to get ourselves focused off of where we are now? So let me take the first part of it, which is absolutely these things used to be settled by wars. It has been less so in recent times. So when the Czechoslovakia broke apart, the, the nasty little secret of all this stuff is you think it's the poor and the oppressed who are the first to leave. That's not true. It's the rich who are the first to leave. So basically, when the Slovaks shut up and said, we want to be a separate country, the Czechs basically said, OK, don't let the door hit you on your way out. See you later. It's northern Italy that wants to leave because they're tired of financing southern Italy and dealing with southern Italy's problems. Right. And it's the Catalans who are closest to leaving in Spain because they're the rich region in Barcelona. And so I don't think that most of these breakups require war which is even scarier because the barrier to leaving becomes lower. Mm 
right? And the second part of it, I think one of the challenges of the pandemic and one of the lessons of the pandemic is you can't build a wall against it. So, you know, if you have people in Africa who are suddenly contagious by this stuff, you're going to put another billion people in the path of COVID, which, by the way, is a really interesting and important question. Why hasn't Africa been hit hard? Why hasn't Nigeria been hit hard? Why hasn't South Africa been hit hard? You know, the thesis of its heat. Well, hey, look, look at Brazil, look at Thailand. I mean, does that have to do with they've dealt with pandemics there already and knew how to put, you know, even limited, but but somehow some force into play that that uh, when it came down, they were able to shut down the society quicker? Like from Ebola, Ebola and all that? That's, that's where this word humility comes in. Right. We, we don't have good answers. I don't have a good answer as to why Massachusetts didn't do better in the second and third waves than Alabama. I don't know why New York didn't do better. Right. I don't know why Texas didn't do worse. I don't know why Florida didn't do worse. Yeah. And again, my thought was, well, maybe it's just Florida is warmer and people are outside more. And then I watched Brazil and said, oh, that's not the answer. I watched Thailand. I thought that's not the answer. So we assume answers to this at our peril. The real answer is we have to vaccinate four or five billion people because otherwise it's going to be the Epsilon variant that takes out the current vaccines or whatever. But coming back to the point, which is a really important point, what the pandemic teaches you is if you don't face pandemics, if you don't face climate change, if you don't face space exploration, if you don't face things like meteorites with a common purpose on a common planet, we're actually a very small place. We're actually a very vulnerable place. We think of ourselves as big and in charge and powerful. But a single meteorite really can ruin your whole day and maybe even your whole planet. And so it behooves us in an era of increased distribution, decentralization of technology to treat each other better and to not leave a lot of angry people far behind. You know, how, how do you think this all affects the future? You know, like, what do you think the future state is, you know, if you'd asked me a couple of years ago, uh, before the rise of extremism in America, I might have thought I could see, you know, through the misty, uh, you know, future. But now I, I, I really feel I have no idea. You know, I think there's no good way of predicting the future. If I were a good futurist, I'd be a lot richer and I, you know, do X, Y, or Z. What I do think you can do is you can take trends that are already in place and extrapolate them. And, and the reason why I wrote a book in 2005 saying, look, there's going to be a giant financial crisis and the long-term effect is it's going to rip nations apart, which was called the untied states of America polarization fracturing in our future, is because there were a series of trends internally and externally that were pretty clear if they weren't fixed, this is where it was going. And the reason why I was able to do some of the same things with genomics and now with brain science is because we evolved to be linear thinkers. We walked across the African savanna and it was one step at a time. And, and it takes a real training and mindset to understand what geometric progression means in science or in politics or in other stuff, in social media. And once you understand that, then you can take and project trends forward and say, if the momentum that is going in this direction doesn't change, here are some of the logical consequences. And you don't get most of it right, but you get some of it right. And that helps you to understand the future. And then what you've got to do is you've got to iterate and say, huh, I was wrong here. Why was I wrong? And fix it and start focusing back on your scenario and prediction. And, and then it becomes a very useful predictive tool. So I wouldn't predict the future. I'd say what's already in place with that wonderful quote. I forget the author. You know, the future's already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Okay. And that is so true. But, but Juan, you know, you, what do we do when, you know, we have people like you that are thinking ahead, you know, way ahead, and you're writing books and you're kind of talking about all this stuff. How do, what, it, I mean, do you have any insight into the human nature that doesn't really want to listen or doesn't, you know, it's the same thing where people have different ideas about science, whether it works or not, whether, or whether it's real or not, or the vaccine is effective or not. Like how, what happened? I mean, how do we gather enough, enough voices 
to be, is it in the youth? Like, where does this come from where we can get some consensus and, and some organization so it doesn't feel so bleak and existential? People aren't fighting over things or thoughts or ideas today, right? When, when you see a fight over X policy or Y policy, that's not really what the fight is about. It's a fight about respect. It's a fight about you don't respect me enough. You don't respect my faith. You don't respect my race. You don't respect my beliefs. You don't respect my job. You don't respect. And I think that the place where you've got to start is quit arguing about the specifics of something. There was a wonderful mentor of mine who used to teach at Harvard Law School who wrote a book called Getting to Yes about negotiation, Roger Fisher. And he taught me something and took me years to understand it, which is when you sit down and negotiate with somebody, build the strongest possible set of arguments your opponent can give and give those arguments to that person. And every time you think of a word, a way to strengthen them, help that person strengthen their arguments, right? And, and when you do that, you're going to fundamentally understand their argument and their position. And then maybe you'll understand whether your position is still legitimate and what you should ask for. And if it's still legitimate in the face of the strongest possible argument that person can deploy, then you end up in a negotiation where you haven't gotten what you want by tricking the other person. You've looked at the other person in the eye and said, look, let, let me just understand exactly what you're saying. And I went out of my way when I, when I write about or talk about things like genome research and synthetic life forms and the rest of the stuff to go and lecture in some of the most conservative universities in the world, in Mexico and the U.S., and Europe, because I think I have to be able to provide an argument and have a debate with people that's not a finger wagging debate of I'm here from X university, I'm here to tell you, and if you don't listen to me, you're an idiot. So I read everything they're reading. I understand what's in their bio classes. I understand what's in their creationism classes. I understand the novels they're reading. And that really helps me. There's a lot of people in this country that read that old Dan Brown novel, um, the uh, one about the not the da vinci code yeah da vinci code. the da vinci code bingo yeah. Yeah. right so there's a lot of listeners probably on this podcast who read that now ask the question how many listeners have also read left behind because left behind sold more copies than the da vinci code and it's a similar story except the good guy is the guy who's left behind when the world is raptured and has to save himself and his daughter and has to become a much better Christian to do that. That thing sold more copies than the Da Vinci Code. Right? Right. And, and those two don't overlap. But to understand and speak to the other side, you've got to listen to what they're saying and what they're learning. It's a basic matter of respect. And as soon as you say you're anti this or you're anti that, therefore there's no reason to talk to you. There's a reason to cancel you. On, on, I'm not talking about you know, there's one particular group over here. The other reason to do it is because there are truly a 1% or a half percent of people who are evil. And those people hide under the banner of they're not just attacking me, they're attacking all of us. We're all in this together. So you can't take out the evil people because they back themselves with big groups of folks. You know, but what happens when, when you sit down with somebody and they start talking about creationism? You know, like just how do you how do you traverse that? You know, you you know the world's six thousand years old, and you know, I mean, how do you how do you deal with that? So I went to a university deep in Kentucky, which taught that, and I got up and I said, "Look, I want to make sure because I wasn't brought up in the same tradition that I understand where you think biology comes from, and my understanding is X Y Z, right? Because I." read this stuff and I'd seen their textbooks and I'd read, looked at what their classes were. And once I got nods in the audience of, wow, this is the first person who has come here and not stood up and said, yeah, a bunch of idiots. The next thing I said is, I'm not here to change your mind, right? You, you've got an idea of how this works. You have texts that tell you this is the way it works. But let me put into your minds a thought. There are a lot of people like me in this world who have a very, very different story in mind. And what I'm going to do for the next hour is I'm going to tell you the story of where my mind comes from, what I believe in. And the reason why you should listen to it is not because I'm here to change your mind. It's because for you and your kids to be able to navigate in a world that is different from yours, 
for them to be successful in a different world, you have to understand the way people like me think. And you have to understand what we believe and, and where it comes from. And then you can decide if you want to change your mind. I'm not here to change your mind. But you cannot have a discussion or get a job in a biotech company or in a pharma company or in XYZ outside of the sphere you're in, unless if you understand that there are people who think differently and what they think and where that thinking comes from. Are we in a sense a victim of our own success? You know, when you take this machine, you know, this phone, you know, it's, it's, you know, this can only exist because of many, many scientific discoveries paid for by the American government. You know, it's like, I mean, just synchronizing with a satellite above and, you know, it, it works flawlessly. Are we a, uh, through basic science, you know, basic science is the root of this thing, you know? And so the difference between creationism and basic science is that we can test hypothesis and we understand, and it actually works. Our phones work, our, you know, our medicines work, these different things work. And we give them to people. And, you know, I think that probably if you'd seen this phone 200 years ago, it would have appeared as magic right? Because the technology is so good, but in a sense, are we a victim of the success of not just the technology, but the ideas that have come before us? So now you can have people who don't believe in the scientific method, and but they don't realize that they're actually using it every day. You know, I, I define myself as an optimistic curmudgeon. <laughs> so <laughs> there is just a whole lot wrong in this world. <laughs> but right. If you take the sort of John Rawls veil of ignorance, you don't know if you're going to be born rich, poor, black, white, gay, whatever, and, and you try to design a society for that. Would you rather be born at random as a woman 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 300 years ago, or as a Hispanic, or as an African-American, or as somebody who lived in China, or as somebody who lived in Mexico? I think you know we've had bad decades. We've had horrible wars. But on the whole, a fifth of humanity has come out of poverty in a very short period of time. Every single one of the UN Millennium Goals for the year 2000 was met. Every single one of those goals. So the amount of people who are malnourished has dropped. The amount of women who get no education, the amount of people who are illiterate. I get the frustration of, my God, there's all this science evidence. There's all this stuff. There's all this to learn. And, and we love learning. And, and if, it appalls me that people wouldn't take the entire Library of Congress that's sitting inside here, plus everything else, and, and just go nuts over that. But you've also got to understand how damn scary this displacement is for so many people. Because they grew up doing certain jobs. They grew up believing in certain things. I, I think back to what I was taught in Jesuit school and grammar school when I went to you know, Catholic mass every morning in Latin from 7 to 8 a.m. in first grade. Every single person there taught me that being gay was horrible. The preacher, the teacher, my peers, my parents, the government, the newspapers. How the hell was I supposed to not grow up a little bigot? A little biased bigot, right? And I learned, again, if technology accelerates our change in what's right and wrong, that anchor of I know right from wrong starts to get dragged and, and starts to get dragged really fast. And... And some of us go, Yahoo, that's great. That is evidence that we can build things better. But other people say, my God, everything that I believe is being yanked from me, is being disrespected, is being torn. And, and it's not just being torn, it's being torn in such a way that the other people think that I'm fundamentally trash. Yeah. And, and then you get a strong man coming in and whipping up these passions and this violence. And, and the that strong man gets a lot of followers, right? And, and look, I'm not justifying the behavior. I'm not justifying being biased. I'm not justifying treating other people in ways that doesn't respect them. I am saying I get where some of these folks come from because I was educated in a very different way. And had I not left Mexico, I might not have the same opinions that I have today. Thank you so much. Yeah, I want to thank you very much. Wonderful. It's a great pleasure. Thank you.